Hello, everyone. Welcome to Adventures Through the Mind, a podcast exploring topics relevant and related to psychedelic culture, medicine, and research. I'm your host, as always, James W. Gesso. Today's interview is going to explore neurofeedback and utilizing neurofeedback technology as a type of progressive overload exercise for building a healthy brain and nervous system. We also talk about mental health disorders as nervous system adaptations to experience rather than pathologies, and where neurofeedback fits fits in as an adjunct to the psychotherapeutic treatment of these disorders. We talk extensively about ADHD, traumatic brain injury, and brain health, and of particular excitement to you psychedelic enthusiasts out there, we talk about psilocybin-informed neurofeedback which is essentially utilizing neurofeedback technology to encourage the brain into entering neurobiological states akin to those of uh, akin to those caused by psychedelic drugs and what that means and what happens is something we explore a little more than halfway through the episode but we talk about that too and we even explore the exciting possibilities of combining neurofeedback and virtual reality technologies and wireless communication to create a type of nexus 5 experience and yes that is a sci-fi novel reference. Anyways the person we are talking to today to explore all these awesome topics is Heather Hargraves. Heather Hargraves is a trauma specialist and researcher in London, Ontario, Canada. Heather specializes in the use of neuro and biofeedback technologies to support a broad range of neurologically and or pathologically traumatized clients within her clinical practice. Heather's research interests investigate the neurological underpinnings of various states of consciousness, including dissociation, meditation, psychedelics, and various polyphasic states of consciousness associated with shamanic practices. Her master's research focused on the therapeutic induction of altered states of consciousness based on research findings related to psilocybin, magic mushrooms, the psilocybin-induced neurofeedback that I just mentioned. Currently, Heather is an advocate for the interface of neurofeedback modalities with psychedelic therapies, with an emphasis on the preparation and integration periods that bookend psychedelic therapies once they are legalized. So that's who we've got on the show. Heather Hargraves, and we're going to talk about neurofeedback, what it is, how it works, how it relates to uh, mental health disorders, and what treating mental health disorders with neurofeedback seems to suggest about the neurobiological basis of those disorders, as well as getting into what is psychedelic-induced, excuse me, informed neurofeedback, and then some fun, wide-eyed, but apparently totally achievable uh, technological innovations for utilizing neurofeedback in VR to basically have really interesting interconnected experiences between brains and nervous systems. But before we get into the episode, I just want to give a big thanks to my patrons on Patreon, especially the people whose names are listed on the screen here on YouTube or in the description to this episode. Those people have been giving generously each month, some of which for a long time, but nonetheless, a huge thank you to my patrons in general. This wouldn't be happening without you. Now, for everyone else, you probably notice I mention Patreon basically on every episode, and that's for two reasons, one of which is people come and go, and sometimes people are tuning in for the first time, and they want to know that Patreon is an option to support the show, and also because... I do this full-time, like this is my full-time job, and Patreon has been something that has enabled me to earn a a regular income through my full-time investments into producing this show for you, and it's been able to do so in a way that allows me to maintain total creative control over the podcast and to focus on producing quality content that you, the listener, enjoys rather than broadly accessible content that's easy to consume that looks good for advertisers and sponsors. So 
Patreon enables me to work full time, earn an income and produce content that you, the listener, enjoy to listen to without having to manipulate that content to serve whatever larger impulses are present in the culture, which I think I don't have any problems with that necessarily, but it's not what I want to do for the show. So Patreon allows that. And it also allows for people who aren't able to give financially to the show to receive the show for free. So, and without those things as well. So people who donate with Patreon, especially people who donate a little bit more are sort of compensating for the people who can't donate at all. So that's also why I bring up Patreon. So if you're listening now and you're liking the show and you would like to become a patron, you can do so for as little as a cup of coffee once a month. So thank you. You can head to patreon.com forward slash jams to be Jesso to become a patron and look at the different pledge options. Or you could just leave me a one-time donation through PayPal or cryptocurrencies listed in the description to this episode. The links are listed. Um, And so that's all for the preamble to the show. Uh, Please enjoy my interview with Heather Hargraves here on Adventures Through the Mind, episode 141. Let's, let's, how do you feel? You feel good? (laughs) All right. So I want to start really generally and then sort of build up from there. Um, Cool. So. Follow your lead. uh, All right. Well. Heather Hargraves, welcome to Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you. I'm really excited to be here with you. This is like more than two years in the making, multiple interactions, (laughs) plans, uh, dismantled plans, reestablished plans, pandemics, and here we are. Yeah, definitely. I'm I'm glad we finally made it to this place. It's great. Yeah. So um, let's start with something really, really general. Um, sort of laying the foundation of where we're going to go here today, which is essentially what is neurofeedback and how does it work? Uh, So neurofeedback is when we use EEG technology. So basically we put sensors on the brain that record the brain waves and different brain waves have been shown to be associated with different states of consciousness are, which are really tied to different patterns of attention, uh, different patterns of arousal in the nervous system. So are we energetic? Are we calm? And then the way these brain waves kind of show up around the brain gives us ideas of what's going on under the hood. So if you were, you know, a mechanic, you get a sense of how to listen when a car is idling just right. And so as a neurofeedback therapist, I start getting a sense of when there's a certain pattern of brain, like waves in a brain, that I have a sense that that person's overall nervous system is communicating well. So when I hear an engine or see brain waves that aren't quite aligned, and the person is reporting to me like, you know, I'm trying to focus, but I really struggle. So it's like a car, you're like, I really try to get up this hill, but my car just can't seem to do it. I go under the hood and the way you go under the hood with neurofeedback is when I see a brainwave that says, ah, that part's going too slow. That's why you can't quite get up that hill or focus your mind the way you want to. I will reward the brain every time it makes a little leap in shifting out of that low gear. So we want to go into a higher gear. So this slow brainwave that's not going to support focus, we would shift into a faster brainwave that would. And every time the brain makes that frequency, you get a reward. So in neurofeedback, we have a variety of ways of giving reward. It can be through a game. So you can have like boats are racing. You got the slow brainwave boat and the fast brainwave boat. Whenever the fast one is going faster, you're getting feedback that, oh, I'm achieving that goal. This is the way I place my attention. This is the way I change the feeling of arousal up or down in my body to achieve that goal. So it enhances self-awareness. The other way we use is auditory feedback. So the music will get louder or quieter. Uh, Sometimes we use lights flashing in the eyes, which can be really good when someone's got cognitive challenges or haptics where there's a vibration that lets the person know or all three at once. (laughs) Hmm. So I think, um, how, how does this, so this, this is something that is happening that, that the neurofeedback is making happen by way of what it's inputting into the brain? Or is it something that it's just, it's just 
telling you when you've managed to shift your attention, your cognitive hmm. engagement, arousal engagement? Because I'm thinking about, I'm thinking about, okay, there's, I'm thinking about a number of things. Okay, brain waves. I'm thinking about binaural beats kind of stuff, mm -hmm. something exogenous that changes um, activation through entrainment. Mm -hmm. And then I'm thinking about stuff like uh, transcranial direct yes, current stimulation, stimulation. right? Yeah. And then I'm thinking, or is it just, is it just reading and then giving you a feedback? So is there yeah. an active assist there or active assist in the sense that the technology is stimulating or is it an active assist just in the sense that the technology is feeding back to you what you're doing or not doing? Yeah, it's just feeding back to you what you're doing or not doing. Uh, I do have the capacity to use stimulation. So I do use pulsed electromagnetic field. There is like TDCS and TMS, all of those things you can get. And some clinics will layer the feedback. So primarily neurofeedback is just a reward. The sensors on the head, I, I don't ever use the term electrode because it freaks clients out a lot of the right, time. Yeah. I said, it's, it's just sensing your brainwave activity. And then every time your brain does what we want it to do, it gets a reward. The interesting thing about that, though, is that our whole existence is built on using things efficiently and effectively. Like the body is seeking homeostasis. And often when we get out of the way, you know, sleep or different things, especially if you can go into deep states of sleep, the body will just heal. You know, you cut yourself, it heals. And it's, but it will be slowed down by inflammation or if too much energy is being used in a way that's not supporting homeostasis. So what's really cool about neurofeedback is that as the body gets an experience of more homeostasis, it actually seeks it. Hmm. So you're learning it consciously, but your subconscious, you know, natural innate healing capacity is also going, oh, our system is being used more effectively. And so the body gets starts leaning into that more easily as well. So it's it's like a bottom up and a top down process. It appears to be. Hmm. You know, I might I might have just checked out there, but I don't think I I don't think I fully understand sort of like where the where the where the difference where's the rest and where's the activation um, in all of that. So you so so what you're saying is neural feedback helps to reduce inflammation and helps to bring about rest in the brain, but then also it brings blood flow, like the way I'm learning over time, how to support a back injury is not less yeah. action, it's more, more mobility, more blood flow, more mm -hmm. whatever. So can you explain that to me a little, a little bit more like again, cause I, I didn't, I didn't yeah. understand. Yeah. 100%. So it is, it's kind of this dance between activity and rest. You know, our nervous system, it has this spectrum of activity and relaxation, but we kind of get stuck instead of having this capacity to resiliency, really to move between activation and rest, we can get stuck in activation or stuck in rest. Mm. So we get stuck in anxiety or stuck in depression, or we start to oscillate really quickly between overactivation crash, underactivation crash, overactivation. So neurofeedback's about bringing balance to whatever state you're stuck in and bringing that ability for the nervous system to be more responsive and less reactive. So if somebody's stuck in low arousal, then yeah, they may free up their resources and they may get more energy as a result. But if someone's also stuck at high arousal, we're going to kind of unlock that system and help them achieve more rest, more restoration. So if you're stuck in low, restoration can come from active. And if you're stuck in active restoration, you can come from being more calm. But in general, you want the flexibility to be able to respond. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then this is something that this is something that the training of which actively changes the operation of your brain and your nervous system. They're one functioning unit. Um, yeah. It changes the sort of the the architecture of how your brain is able to be operated through your yeah. conscious engagement and how it generally operates autonomically. Is that, is that correct? Yeah, I would say that the way I describe it is it increases the capacity for communication, complexity and relationship within the nervous system. So you have a wider range of perceptual processes that you can access, because the architecture is ordered in such a way that it's easier to traverse. So if you went to a playground, 
and half the monkey bars were broken and different things like the bridge has fallen down. Like it, it's not so much fun to play. So that architecture is, yeah, it can help tie some of the bridges together and help align the monkey bars so that you have a little more freedom in how you want to play. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So, um, neurofeedback is, is presented as being something that you can use as a, as a treatment or a therapeutic protocol for mental health issues, depression, um, the mental health issues that come along with age related cognitive decline, as well as ADHD and even, and even trauma. And I'm wondering, uh, if you could give us a, a larger sense of, of why and how neurofeedback can, uh, be effective for treating these conditions. I think maybe you so, kind of just did, but specific to yeah, from like a mental health you. therapy standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So when I look at mental health, I look at it very much along the lines of adaptive responses. Um, you know, the DSM has been helpful in giving us frameworks to understand this spectrum that people can kind of traverse. But as um, neuroscience is moving forward and even the NIMH is starting to say, you know, hey, we need to look deeper with these classifications to understand what are the deeper underpinnings there. And so more generally, and, and I, I really got this from my friend, uh, Raphael, who, you know, Lancelotta, mm -hmm. and his therapy practice is called Habituating to Wholeness. And I love that title because, yeah, we habituate to our environment. So when I meet with clients, I want to understand, and I think you had referenced this before, this narrative, like, how did you get to where you are? You know, what were the situations and experiences that you had in your life that led you to a place of needing to either, you know, kind of shut down to feel good or to be really vigilant and activated in order to feel safe? So people tend to, we have a variety of temperaments. Um, one way I had this described to me was by a friend who said that uh, an Anishinaabe elder had taught him this, where we have in the river, there's the rocks, the water, and the bubbles that dance on top. And people's temperament tends to fall along that spectrum. So the bubble dancers are a little more of the activated, kind of happy, joyous people. I'm one of the bubbly people for sure. The watery people tend to be they just kind of go with the flow. They're kind of even keel. They can go this way or that way. And we've got our more like rock, you know, like the Buddha types that you kind of just go sit beside to feel grounded and calm. But you still need to have the ability to move through that spectrum overall. So if you're a rock, it to avoid you know, the activation, because maybe as a child, your household was really chaotic and busy all the time. And so you learn to kind of dissociate to get away from all this energy, the yelling, the screaming, different things that were going on. Now you've, that's not a temperament anymore, or maybe your temperament was to be a rock, but then that's what led you to idle and lockdown in that area and to cope by shutting down because you just, activation was never something that was taught as a safe place or an exciting experience or a nourishing experience. And the same for children, sometimes who are more on the activated end, if they grew up in a similar environment, they may have learned to always be on guard and be prepared so that they could catch it and never get in trouble and never get yelled at and make sure or be really perfect so that you know, they could traverse their environment. Both of those are really adaptive responses. There's, the trouble I have is when we get into pathologizing sometimes through diagnostics is saying this is a disorder. That's not a disorder. That's a habituation. Mm. And I want to understand why your nervous system came to the place to use energy in that way. And I find when I do this with clients, they're, they start to get insight into why does my nervous system work this way? What might my underlying temperament be? But then Where's I call it emotional cardio, meaning can I start to move from this fixed tight place to opening up and learning to be in intimacy? Or can I learn to be from this really quiet, closed place and open up once in a while to play and explore the safety that falls within this region of our overall nervous system experience? And so with the technology, 
I can help clients sense, you know, it is dangerous to calm down. Like that threatens survival. And so how do you ever get to that place if you're not getting a reward that that's, hey, that's actually okay. And someone discussing it with you that this is a new relational task. If we're progressively overloading your nervous system into a new experience of a state that you just don't have a, you know, a healthy relationship with. Hmm. So <laughs> it, it, do, it does make sense. I mean, at the end there, I was starting to wonder like what, like if I didn't know you were talking about neurofeedback, it would just sound like you were talking about psychotherapy and then you have this technological um, mm -hmm. augmentation to the process that directly supports that sort yes. of like re reward guidance sort of mm -hmm. thing um, through, through a, a very neurophysiological feedback mechanism. Yeah. And so it's like, it's almost like uh, utilizing techno a technological augment in combination with an actual person in the room mm -hmm. to facilitate the type of co-regulation and nervous system remapping necessary yes. to uh, affectively exist in a way yes. that is more in, uh, co like more coherent with the with a, a healthy, a healthy person in the world, being a healthy yeah. person in the world, individually, yeah. relationally, and socially. Is that kind of fair? 100%. The way uh, my supervisor described it when I when I first started working at the clinic, and she brought neurofeedback in, she's like, it's almost like some like we send clients to you. And it's like they were a little bud, and then they just start to blossom. And I say it's like their fragrance starts to emerge. So people just start to open up to the boundaries of who they are. They're not just staying closed anymore. They feel like they can finally stretch into themselves and start to embody themselves. And so, yeah, there's lots of therapies, you know, especially somatic therapies that allow people to do this. But coming from a trauma lab where we were just studying, how do you help someone who's in such a dissociative state, in such a traumatized state, where current modalities are not helping them? We have found that through the use of technology, we can start to awaken them a little bit, we can give them that gentle nudge and also the reward to let them know that it's safe, because the interpersonal reaction has never been safe. That's, mm. they just don't have a foundation for that. So when you have this, you know, third party technology objective measure, it makes it a little bit easier to challenge and to also bypass like the ego formations that have been put in place that the therapist just sounds like wah, 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 because mm -hmm. they don't have higher order prefrontal activation if you're in this highly vigilant state. So we kind of bypass and just speak directly to the nervous system. And as the nervous system gets reward through sound, through haptics, it starts to get this sense of felt safety and some relaxation happens. So the body will relax, but then the ego will go, oh, what? And so clients will get activated. There's a real thing called relaxation induced anxiety, where if a client has been in a certain state for a very long time, when you start moving their nervous system out of that, they fight it. So even with therapy, people will fight it. So when I can work with them and have the tech and say, this is progressive overload, this is gym training, this is cardio, it's going to be uncomfortable. But I also want to make it, you know, I don't want to overtrain you. So it, it just gives us that fine line to start rocking them out of those grooves that they're stuck in. Hmm, interesting. You know, when you said that re relaxation induced anxiety, mm -hmm. it, uh, I mean, and I, I'd love to talk a little bit about ADHD. I mean, the stuff that you're mm -hmm. talking about here, healing from trauma. Okay. From yeah. trauma, we can attach that to, you know, like acute shock trauma of events that have mm -hmm. happened, car accidents, assault, et cetera, um, all the way back to long-term like long-term trauma that is rooted mm -hmm. in a person's identity through their development, developmental trauma, complex mm -hmm. trauma, sort of like working with the same, uh, working with the same sort of mechanisms, just addressing mm -hmm. each thing slightly differently based on what they are. Um, but I'm thinking now about, um, oh, and that all of those things would present as the symptoms that are then classified as categorical categorical yes. mental illnesses, depression, yeah. PTSD, OCD, etc. And that yeah. there's neurological and psychological sort of interminglings of those two and trying to figure out which needs what in what ways to sort of move towards the type of healthy, healthy life that you're maybe yes. going for in therapy. Um, and I'm thinking specifically about ADHD and I want to make that I'm going <clears> to, <throat> I'm going to use, I'm going to, I'm going to take over 
uh, and take advantage of the podcast um, <laughs> to see if I can get some per- some personal consultation here because now I'm thinking a lot mm-hmm. about ADHD. Mm-hmm. And when you said anxiety induced relaxation, I am reminded of an experience I have regularly, mm-hmm. which is um, I generally am working all day long, very cognitive labor, lots of task switching, and sometimes it goes really well, and sometimes it does not go very well. But either way, it's attempting to keep myself engaged and vigilant to something all day long, and either it's the thing I'm attending to, or it's the thing I don't want to be attending to, and then the consequential sort of like self-deprecating narratives that, that, you know, like that cycle in and then everything gets worse. Okay. Those are the bad days or the not so great days. Um, and generally the trend is vigilant, 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 vigilant until done. <laughs> right. And done means I'm done. I'm either done cause I've just given up for the day and it doesn't make sense mm-hmm. for me to keep stressing myself out or I'm done for the day. Cause it's like, okay, mm-hmm. the day is done. This is assuming I haven't taken, uh, pharmaceuticals to support my day, like um, yeah. Vyvanse, for example, which I prefer not to do generally. Mm-hmm. Um, and then done means dinner. And up until recently, because I'm finished, uh, all the episodes I've watched so far, I'd eat dinner, watch Star Trek. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Soon as Star Trek is done, or whatever it is, that's when it's time to relax. Then it's the evening and this anxiety wells up in me. Which yeah. I can, I can, I can make go away by watching more episodes, staying stimulated up here in a way that's very passive, but still sort of stimulated, but the anxiety comes. Um, and so in that, okay, in that little anecdote and anxiety or relaxation induced anxiety, um, I feel like I'm learning something and maybe you could feed back to me about yeah. what I'm attempting to compensate in my ADHD brain for by attempting to push vigilantly towards stimulation, which at the end of the day in relaxation, I now feel anxiety in the transition phase. So can you outline what's happening there in my brain um, and what it is I'm attempting to compensate for? So individuals who have ADHD, I mean, there's a different variance, but given that Vyvanse works for you, it's likely that you've got slow wave in your frontal lobe. And so we actually want the back of the head to go slower and the front of the head to go faster. So you may be experiencing, um, I'd have to look at your whole brain, but definitely it sounds like they're slowing in the front. So individuals who are not taking a substance will will stim, right? This is why these kids are so hyper and moving around all the time. It's the only way to keep the brain awake. So you're stimming all the time, but that means you're keeping your actual physiology up. So your heart rate's up, your blood pressure's up, everything is up to stimulate the cingulate Uh, Because when you actually look at a fMRI that's enhanced, it's really interesting to watch how the heartbeat pumps through the brain and pumps right through the cingulate, which is kind of like our error detection when it's over aroused. So when someone has a hot cingulate, which is the opposite of someone with ADHD, we say they have OCD. Hmm. It's like hyper obsessed. They can't get out of that gear. And then ADHD is like a sleepy one. So they'll, they'll keep themselves up to like pump the blood and wake the brain up. But you have these baroreceptors, and and some of this is still being researched, but generally there's these receptors on the arteries of the heart that sense how much blood is going through and gives you an overall understanding of kind of your parasympathetic and your sympathetic arousal. So say baseline is here. If you are starting to become too aroused, your body goes, oh, homeostasis kicks in and says, no, 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 we got to calm you down. And if you go too slow, then it's going to kick in and speed you up. But you've been using your nervous system in such a way that you've actually sped up your baseline. Hmm. So now when you try to slow down, your body thinks that's too slow. And so your whole system will kick up gear saying, no, we're getting close to like not breathing or dying, or this is below our comfortable resting rate. Hmm. So the vasculature and the baroreceptors kind of just get reset every day based on use. So the best way usually to start like balancing that out is to use HRV breathing. So heart rate variability breathing, because both the cingulate and the heart have like kind of pacemakers in them. And they're attuned by 0.1 hertz frequencies because they're both kind of idling or best idling there as what I've been taught by some of my supervisors. 
And when you breathe at 5.5 breaths per minute, you're breathing at 0.1 hertz. So it's this incredible exercise that it's almost like just like a tuning fork, like ding, and the system starts to calm. So one of the things I do with my clients, because I want to create a resource or a space in their nervous system for us to start moving in new directions, is I get them to do regular HRV breathing. Um, some neurofeedback therapists will even add in, they'll give skin conductance. So you get a little thermostat and you work on raising the temperature in your hands by a degree or so. And that's the same thing. It creates a parasympathetic response. So the blood has gone from, you know, in the heart, in sympathetic charge, go, 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 to calming the system down so that when we do neurofeedback, we're less likely to push someone off the cliff of relaxation induced anxiety. So you could finish Star Trek and move into HRV breathing for about 10 minutes. And you might start finding that it's a more gentle transition into rest. Hmm. Interesting. So I'm thinking about uh, this might, I mean, there's maybe a lot of things, but one thing I I noticed is I can, I can do random stuff all day long. Mm -hmm. As long I can do random stuff. I think on on my phone on my computer, I can do a million things all day long and that's fine. But it's very hard for me to like switch my brain on to attend to something deeply for a long period of time. And I think some of that is, is the the fundamental challenge of our technological environment mixing with my own sort of like where my Mm -hmm. own sort of like strengths and weaknesses are easily Mm -hmm. overtaken by this, by these challenges. And I notice that it's almost impossible for me to wake up in the morning sometimes. Like Mm -hmm. I just can't get my brain turned on. I have to like start doing what I'm doing and just trust that like the yerba mate and the the choline and the tyrosine is going to turn me on and then I run that out until I start to like fade out and then I'm kind of, I kind of crash. Or I take Vyvanse and I feel all Mm -hmm. well and good, but my, my blood pressure is all weird and then I don't sleep. And so it's like this weird trade off. So what you're saying is that like my frontal lobe is just not really turning on. And Mm. the way that I'm managing to turn it on is by turning everything up. And then when the things that I'm using to turn everything up start to go away, my nervous system starts to freak out as it all starts to come down thinking like, Hey, we're about to fall into below baseline. Mm -hmm. This isn't our baseline that we've been at all day and that we tend to idle at or, add substances so that we can exist there. So yeah, when you get below that, your nervous system isn't comfortable with it because it's so forced up all the time that that becomes, yeah, your idling rate is too high. Mm -hmm. Is HRV breathing a similar, that's a way to bring everything down in a coherent Mm -hmm. way. But Mm -hmm. what about, okay, I'm just going to ask you, is there some way other than neurofeedback that I could be turning on my prefrontal, my, my frontal lobes without stimulants in the morning? Yeah, well, I would wonder about exercise, like high intensity cardio, things that get your blood rate, your blood pumping for you in the morning in and of itself. But that sometimes that works for people like, but I don't know how long it would work if your brain has been idling this way for quite some time. Like we might actually need to train it. Certain breathwork practices would probably help, like a lot of fire breathing, kapalabhati, different things that like wake up the frontal lobe. But until like you some try Wim them, Hof kind of stuff. Yeah, Wim Hof. Well, Wim Hof is an interesting one. Uh, I'd have to see. That. So Wim Hof and like soma breathing. I don't know. I know more about soma. Tend to also induce like an altered state. They actually quiet down the DMN, um, and so. It would depend on how good you are with equanimity and if part of what's happening and why energy is being sucked out of your frontal lobe is because it's all in the back of your head, mind wandering and busying itself with like all of these other tasks instead of focus. Mm. So there can be a couple different mechanisms that are causing ADHD. Even um, Marty Teicher, he looked at development across the lifespan. And again, I come back to trauma. That's kind of where <laughs> my wheelhouse is. But some ADHD is tied to something happened early in life, I think between the ages of three and six, when the cingulate was developing, that actually disrupted that period of growth. And so that's can lead to ADHD later in life. So it depends what was happening in the home or if a child had a head injury. And that's where the physiotherapy of neurofeedback can also shine in getting those connections woken up again or finding 
adaptive ways around it. I did have a significant head injury at uh, at about three years old. I fell yeah. off a bike on a I, I mean, this is one of the things that my parents quickly learned that they made a terrible mistake about, which was like, I had gotten a new bike with these training wheels and they, they didn't have a helmet for me yet. And it was like, well, he's just on the balcony. We're right here. It's going to be fine. But the training wheels weren't very stable either. So I fell off and smashed my head against the railing of the balcony and split my head open, bleeding everywhere, had to get or whatever. And I've had multiple head injuries since that, including slamming the back of my head really intensely and I think four or five head injuries in my life, which probably uh, concussions, which contributes, but that's interesting to, that's interesting to consider. Okay. So we'll, we'll leave this now, but (laughs) it's just further assertion as to once things are more manageable during the pandemic for me to come by and do some work with you. Yeah. Um, One more thing before, go ahead, please. I had a, I, yeah, I was a friend who has ADHD and I was like, well, let's just, let's just try this once and see how it goes. And I remember for three or four hours after she was just like, (laughs) she didn't even know how to speak because she couldn't believe how clear things were, you know, that, but it's just, it's just got to get that gear out of place. Mm -hmm. And for me, I guess my specialty is in neurofeedback. So I know how to use that tool. I'm certain that there are a lot of other tools that people can use, but it's been challenging for me to find them, but kind of once you get the ball rolling, then the other tools work a lot better. So even EMDR therapists will sometimes send people for neurofeedback first, because then they find once everything's kind of talking and the wheels are oiled, then the EMDR starts to work a little bit better. Yeah. I mean, even, even uh, Bessel van der Kolk's sort of seminal work on, on trauma, the body keeps the score. There's a whole chapter dedicated to how effective uh, neurofeedback was and using the case study of a woman who had, um, uh, or what do they call it now? Dissociative identity disorder rather than multi dissociative identity disorder and Uh, extreme stuff. And that neurofeedback Mm -hmm. helped her get back into sort of like being a healthy, normal, cognitively functioning person. It's, It shines like you've never seen it shine when you're working with people with really significant disorders from trauma because they're just, their self is just so all over the place that a couple tuning fork sessions and they're suddenly like, oh, and they start to center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how many, how often do do sessions like this need to happen in order to, to generate the type of like baseline needed to then step into the rest of your life? Of course, you know, the, the nervous system is shaped by experience, reshaped by ongoing experience, you know, like mm-hmm. muscles get trained, you know, you're sort mm-hmm. of training a muscle to do a thing, you know, mm-hmm. how, how often say in my, you don't know anything about my brain, say sort of like, uh, how often do you think somebody who is relatively well functioning, but struggling with say attention would have mm-hmm. to go in order to get to a certain level where they can take it from there based on now just being able to use their brain? Or is it something that you have to do forever and ever? Or is it something you have to go back in for tune-ups for? Like what is sort of the, what is a common sort of treatment protocol? It is a little bit like the gym. So, you know, in the beginning, it's important. If you can train, people can train two to three times a week. That's pretty great. A lot of the times cost effective wise, you know, once a week is what we get. 10 to 20 sessions, you should start seeing some pretty notable changes within that time. And then you kind of recalibrate from there how much someone needs. But as a therapeutic tool, it allows me to really like, get the wheels moving and then build those somatic relationships, work on those cognitive pieces, kind of re get like the system reattuned. And sometimes people don't actually need a lot, they just needed that rocking out. Mm. So I will find that if a clinician is using neurofeedback without therapy, you're going to see a much higher number of sessions. So I'm not a huge advocate of that where they just come in, beep, 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 send you away. I mean, for epileptic disorders and stuff, that makes a lot of sense. That's kind of how it's going to work. But when it's a dance, you've got to assess the person and understand how much of this is relational use of their own energy and an adaptive habituated response and how much of it is there's just some gears stuck and shifted from injuries that need to be woken up and kind of, to get moving again. Hmm, hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking about um, there's a, a neurofeedback clinic here in, mm-hmm. in my city, or well, Kitchener Waterloo. They're different, but kind of the same city. Um, yeah. And uh, they use Neural Optimal. 
yeah. uh, which is a program from what I understand, it's just like a one size fits all. You go in, I, I've done this sort of like free trial, just go yeah. in and you hang out there for a little while in the, in the mm -hmm. dark, look at a screen and then all done. And then you leave. Yeah. Yeah. We consider, I consider that my understanding of neurooptimal is the EG light. Um, there are various degrees of neurofeedback. And so are you using a single sensor, which is going to be more amplitude training, or are you actually using a full headset that allows us to really target like source localization and get like deeper into the basis of what's going on in the brain. And so I really do like having my full 19 channels or at least having eight to 10 channels that I can work with. So I can do like cross frequency coupling and like more phase amplitude, deeper processes, whereas I don't know enough about neurooptimal, but I, I'm not sure. I know it's pretty simplistic. Some people get a lot. I'm told it's best for the worried well. Hmm. The for the but worried well. Then the you have to wonder well. how much uh, placebo is there. Or not that placebo is a bad thing. You, you oh, know, do the song and dance. We make placebo all the time, yeah, it's right? Great, like, you know? It's the power of attention and awareness. And so I, I talk to my clients about that. The, the more engaged you are in this process, the better it is, but that's why I try to use it mostly as a reflective mirror. Like, what are you learning from it as opposed to, hey, this beep, beep magic, like kind of, sometimes it pulls the attention into the nervous system, which pulls your awareness into the moment, which is pretty healing in and of itself. So I wonder if NeuroOptimal is more working on that level of mm -hmm. like, just if you went to the forest, you'd get a similar response, right? Mm -hmm. Like I'm in the forest, my attention is now being pulled outward. I am not stuck in my head so much. I feel calmer. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. So let's, let's, let's let that go for a second. I think you know, there's a pretty strong, strong, <laughs> strong chance here that I'm jumping the gun. Um, because yeah. I think we, you and I both know where we want to get to at the end to talk about something in particular, <laughs> exciting development in, in, in your work here. Um, yeah. and I don't necessarily want to go there yet, but I want to talk a little bit about, um, home tech, <clears throat> yeah. right. And, and if something akin to, what you're talking about for okay say for trauma for depression for whatever um let's let's categorize it say like you have the adhd and then you have the ptsd and then i could be totally making terrible categorizations here but like <laughs> are, are there are there home technologies yeah. that you can that you can use um in order to get these types of effects without without going to a therapist's office so i'm thinking for example the muse something like yeah. that yeah um, so the muse for the frontal lobe, you know, it's, it's only hanging out here. And a lot of these disorders are actually more in the roots of the tree, whereas that's the branches of the tree. So if you're only trying to prune the branches, but it's actually more of like a supply of nutrient issue that may not take you so far, but it could be good for some basic attentional training or some basic meditation training. And some people have added you know, there's uh, different software companies that have now added different neurofeedback protocols and you can stick a sensor in and then you, but you, then you have to know how to be a bit of a neurofeedback therapist and paste and gel and moving the sensor around and making sure the placement is right. But a therapist can work from a distance. Um, some of the bigger neurofeedback companies like Eager or BrainMaster, both of those that I work with, they do have units you can rent uh, for home use. And to buy a home use unit with two to four sensors and channels is about $2,000 at this point in time. So for people who can afford it, they can do that. But then I have to go through the process of getting them to set the paste up. And then they also have to know where all the references are. And then I've got to lead them through all the software mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. to get them to do it. So it, it can be, you have to be motivated at this point in time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Interesting. So um, let's move on to a different question here now. Mm -hmm recent podcast I've listened to with you, you told um, a very, a, a, a story that I was very moved by the sort of journey of your, your journey into trauma yeah. and neurofeedback um, through uh, a car accident and through the mm -hmm. death of your brother, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the things that you talked about there is that throughout, throughout that you were struggling a lot with chronic pain. Yeah. Um, as a as coming out of the car accident, um, the consequence mm -hmm. of the death of your brother being slightly different. Um, mm -hmm. But I'm Along wondering the same timeline. Yeah. yeah. So I'm wondering. <laughs> I'm wondering, uh, and this is on maybe on a totally different 
totally different frame, which is that mm -hmm. is there is did you find benefit in your chronic pain through neurofeedback? Does neurofeedback have a potential mechanism of helping to treat chronic pain that's coming as a consequence of of a, say a car accident or for myself a exercised induced um, back injury? Yeah. Definitely, because even as you express, you know, you're learning that it's this balance between how am I holding my tension and my relaxation and figuring that out. And I found that I got to a place, I think it was seven years of chronic pain, and I had six different surgeries, I'd had significant injuries and almost died in my accident. And I started to get to a place where I'm like, how much of this is just me holding on to the pain, because it's just become such a habituated process of tension. I'm so stuck in tension that I'm stuck in this pain cycle. I can't quite like I just become so tense and then I just burn out and then I just crash. And so that was some I still use it to this day. Like if I end up having pain, I've kind of I say pain was my first meditation teacher. I really had to learn to live with it and to surrender to it when it is there to help it kind of move through a little bit quicker and welcoming it as oh, it's just my body talking to me. And once I'd had, you know, scans, and I knew there wasn't actually like a bulging disc or something that was generally impinging on my nerves, I could start working with like, okay, well, what does subtle tension and subtle attentional changes? How does that affect my relationship with my pain and my ability to cope with it? And at sometimes even like release it completely. Mm. So and I've helped several like I've had a handful of clients, I work in motor vehicle accidents, so chronic pain, head injuries, you know, PTSD are things that I see on a regular basis. And many clients do report a reduction in their pain because they're just not as tense, which brings down the inflammation, uh, they're not ruminating as much, which also brings down tension in the body. And they start to just open up to more of a relationship. Some people do live with chronic pain, and I do my best to support them and at least, you know, finding uh, some sort of relational medium with what they have to deal with every day. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, so I, I'm like, okay, putting that in the bank. I assume it's helpful <laughs> yeah. for the listeners too. Um, all right. So moving on, the thing that got me tuned into the fact that you were a person doing neurofeedback stuff is that you were occupying a very unique place, which I, I don't know if this is the case, but from what I understand, you were the first person to do this, which is something I think you called psychedelic informed neurofeedback. I want to yeah. know about what this is. And I think it would be helpful if you presented it in like narrative form of sort of like what inspired you to look at it? What did you first do? What did that show you about what was possible and where are you at now? Yeah. Uh, so I went back to school um, and I was trying to understand how to work with my pain and understand why meditation and different techniques had helped me kind of start developing a new relationship with even the trauma I was experiencing and the dissociation I was experiencing. And for my undergrad, I studied meditation and I studied in a lab that was affiliated with research, also doing trauma research. So I had a teacher uh, brought in a neurofeedback therapist to one of my classes and she gave a talk on neurofeedback. And I remember I just felt like my soul had left out of its body. It was the first time somebody spoke about neurofeedback in such a way that, or spoke about my experience in such a way that made sense of what I had felt. So after my accident, I just felt like my whole body and mind had been rewired and I was kind of standing to the left of myself and I couldn't quite figure out how to get back in and they just kept saying I feel like my brain was rewired I don't know what happened and then she stands up there and she's like so you can rewire your brain and we can use these technologies to kind of like figure things out and sometimes with trauma people's brains just get rewired and so we have to reconnect it and I was what so I ended up looking deeper into neurofeedback and my lab, and I started uh, doing research as a support for some master students who were studying a specific form of neurofeedback called alpha down. And they were comparing it to a, uh, like a traditional like quiet mind or guided meditation. And so I got uh, experience setting up sensors and just learning how to work with the EEG and like watching what they were doing, but I didn't quite understand what it was just yet. 
And then when I got into my master's program, because I'd been working in the lab, my supervisor approached me and said, you know, there's an opportunity to do more research in this field. We've actually noticed that there's an overlap between dissociative states and psychedelic states. And that this alpha frequency that we've been working with in a psychedelic state, it's not just the alpha frequency, but it's actually everything from one to 20 hertz, which is delta, theta, alpha, beta, seems to quiet in the brain. And it's like wrapped around this alpha frequency drop. And the alpha frequency drop is heavily tied to our default mode network and our sense of self. And you see a lot of that in the psychedelic lingo and literature right now that it's modulating the DMN. Uh, so I was really interested in that. And we all got together in the lab. I think there was three or four of us and we, we tried it. And I remember I went home that night and I had all this goo in my hair. So I was taking a shower and I was looking down at the ground and I was like, wow, I'm like, the bubbles are so pretty. So pretty. I like sat down, I was started playing with them, and then I was like, <laughs> I am definitely in an altered state right now. Like this is not my normal state. And it was a very like um effervescent and kind of playful state. So then I talked with my supervisor and I was like, oh my God, this is so exciting. Like who's who gets this research? He said, Well, if you want it, it would be really great for you to do it. So I was like, okay, so we kind of got special permission for me to do my master's in counseling, but my thesis was more in neuroscience because he was going to be supervising me. And they said, okay, go ahead. And I just ran into the program, like guns a blazing, like people were still trying to figure out their thesis and we had worked over the summer. And by the time it was the first day of my master's, I was already running participants. So I ended up running over probably a hundred people through this and during my master's program, I was giving myself the neurofeedback on a regular basis. And I started recognizing that it felt really good. Like after I did, I, everything felt clear. I felt like I could just, I had more insight. I felt lighter. My focus was really great. The girls in my program started noticing like, how are you so productive? Like, what, what are you doing? So I'm just giving myself neurofeedback three days a week while in the midst of training all of these people. Um, and then from there, we just continued to research it and apply it clinically and started understanding like, oh, this seems to be like a real nice attunement in bringing people into a sense of equanimity. So when we're tinkering with the default mode network, it's really similar to doing a Zen practice or a transcendental meditation practice. And from there, I actually discovered the Neuro Meditation Institute and Dr. Jeff Durant and when I started taking courses with him, I realized how re closely related it was to the research I was doing. So then I started working with him, teaching there, and it's just, I don't know if the rest has <laughs> continued to write itself. Hmm, interesting. So let me get let me get this straight. When you said you you said you got to a point where you're like, oh, there's this correlation between what they're noticing in psilocybin research mm -hmm. and this particular uh, neurofeedback protocol. And you said, mm. so we tried it. If what you tried was basically something like looking at the fMRI data from psilocybin and then attempting to reverse engineer it into a neurofeedback protocol that used neurofeedback to encourage and reward your brain to enter a similar brain state as to what yep. psilocybin induces pharmacologically. Yeah. And it was a uh, EEG and MEG is what we got it from. But yes. You're just like, wow, well, that's what we see is happening there. And let's see if ha what happens if we try to mimic it. And that's what we've done with the Neuro Meditation Institute, too, is just looked at this wealth of data. And then you start playing with protocols and getting a sense of ah, when I'm like tinkering over here. Yeah, that does reflect a certain specific state change. And then you let each individual share with you what's the state change that they're experiencing. And then over time, you start seeing specific patterns. Hmm. And this is stuff that you did specifically with the EEG, MEG stuff with psilocybin. Did you explore it with the EEG, MEG stuff around other stuff? Um, I don't know if this has been done for MDMA, or I think it's been done for DMT, 5-MeO-DMT. Have you explored like this a similar sort of process with these different mm -hmm. states? Yeah, we've started to. So Jeff has actually done quite a bit uh, with DMT, and he 
he finds that if it's close to after someone has used DMT, you can almost bring the DMT state back, especially if we're wow. using more of an S. Loretta protocol. So you have more sensors on the head and we're working with the medial prefrontal cortex, which is another area that gets suppressed. So it's more of an anchoring down. Uh, MDMA is more of an insula gamma kind of felt experience. And so that's actually very close to loving kindness meditations. So when I have clients that are ready for it, we can start working with the insula and waking the insula up and giving them a gamma boost there. And then I walk them in through a meditative state where you think about compassion, the people that you care for, like a traditional meta practice, but the idea is, is dropping into the felt sense. Hmm. And so when the person finally opens up that felt sense and you really get gamma humming in the <laughs> insula, people will cry. Like they get filled with this warmth, filled with this love, and you just keep rewarding them going higher and higher. Interestingly, though, the insula is also tied to shame and shutdown and lack of feeling. So modulating that area of the brain is really helpful for empathy, which is why MDMA is so powerful. Hmm. One of the reasons. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so psychedelics are illegal presently. Mm -hmm. Psilocybin is illegal presently, unless you're associated to one of the few institutions that have uh, exemption from that, mm -hmm. from that law. And so there's likely there are ethical concerns around providing any type of therapy to someone consuming psilocybin, right? Mm -hmm. So hypothetically, what do you think might be the possible sort of consequence or complement of say mixing neurofeedback with uh, act like a pharmacologically active psilocybin state given psilocybin's uh, you know, observable effect on neuroplasticity in particular, mm -hmm. both sort of increase in, in functional neuroplast, uh, functional plasticity, like mm -hmm. changing the way the established connections are, are, are established, as well as the increase of the sort of brain factors required to turn that functional change into a structural change. Hypothetically, what might be the, what might be the overlap there? And what do you think might be some possibilities? So around the experience, it can be really helpful and useful. So without me needing to work with anyone in the active state, I don't have to engage in that. But people can go off and do whatever it is they want to do. Mm -hmm. But following a psychedelic experience, we know there's about a one or two week window where entropy is kind of more, um, well, you just have greater entropy in the brain in general, which means you've got more flexibility. So it's like you've come out of a nice infrared sauna before you get your massage. That mm. may be a deeper massage. So if I work with people in this critical window when entropy is high, the odds are they're going to have more uptake, more openness. You know, we see this openness to experience. So they have more openness to shifting their ideas to working with brain states that they've been idling in for a long time. We have less relaxation induced anxiety because there's less rigidity in the networks. And what we have seen that if we take a map before and take a map after a psychedelic state, and then you look at the difference in the brain of that individual person, and then you make a customized treatment plan using Z score training, which is a mathematical equation to understand the changes that have happened around specific sensors in the brain, which relate to different locations. If we start rewarding them for that change, it's completely individual for that or unique to that person. But then as entropy comes down, you've helped them hold the shift that they've achieved with the psychedelic states. So you've cleared the slate and then you're doing this therapeutic work and that person feels more open or well, we can hold that state as their brain becomes more rigid instead of them going back into the world and then getting back into their habits and their practices. And then you can almost sometimes reinforce the very thing that you're trying to change if you're not cognizant of that flexibility following the experience. Hmm. I don't want to talk about this right now, but what you just described is like a, like a neural, a, a neural feedback, like a, a technologically augmented 
um, process for achieving something that recently I've been thinking about writing about helping people through from an integration standpoint, but yeah, from, a, integration. from, from, uh, from a non-technologically augmented um, mm. protocol, which we could nerd out about sometime off the record. I want to keep this sort yeah. of hush hush from the public until I have it sort of fully, fully formed, yeah. but that's, that's so exciting. That's so exciting to hear about. Yeah. yeah. Do you think yeah, something, really fun. uh, go, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> um, so, so that's 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 surrounding the journey. I think that that's that's very interesting prospect. Do you think that um, that the introduction of say, and I mean, we're going totally hypothetical here. I don't, I don't even know what kind of research there is on what I'm about to say, but we have something like the the Stamets protocol. This idea of yeah. microdosing psilocybin plus lion's mane plus niacin to sort of like have this entourage effect pharmacologically that increases our capacity to repair and lay new neural connections, new sort of uh, yeah, new new neural new neural connections. Is would something like that? Do you think that could work synergistically with a standardized neurofeedback program? Yeah, it's pretty standard practice among neurofeedback therapists to really work on adaptogens, making sure someone's diet is, you know, streamlined. And the more resources you can give the body to bring inflammation down and ready the body for change, the more likely the body will be receptive and open to feedback on what it's doing and achieve that change over time. So if I have a client who doesn't have a good diet, isn't getting enough oils, isn't getting enough water, I'm like, you know, I, I can't recruit resources to make change because I need extra resources for that to happen. And your body right now, all the workers in your body are busy fighting and trying to repair what's going on down there. So I can't ask them to come up to the brain. So what we'll see when that's happening with individuals who don't have this a deeper support system, particularly in the gut, is that they'll have like a an hour or two hours, maybe a day of change, and then they just go back. Mm -hmm. So they they don't quite hold the change each session, and it doesn't really progress. Hmm. Interesting. Um, do you want to do you, Do you have any any space or any like any tangent that you feel that you'd like to explore around the relationship of the microbiome to the capacity of changing? your neurobiology through a process like neurofeedback? Uh, in general, we just find that it's, it's necessary to address someone's diet. Um, some of the, that's why I actually have the pulsed electromagnetic field even is that I'll put it on people's stomachs hmm. to help reduce inflammation over time. And sometimes I'll use that during sessions when we're just doing talk therapy for a little while before I'll even introduce the neurofeedback. If I find that they're not holding change, there's been research that shows that, yeah, you've got to reduce the inflammation and you have to improve the microbiome or the brain to have enough resources to make change. You know, it's like you got to feel yourself before our fitness. Hmm. Hmm. Cool. Um, I think this is, I think this is jumping backwards, but I, mm -hmm. but I want to, I want to ask you about it. Um, and it, and it's, the whole question is predicated on this question, which is, do you have much familiarity and knowledge of the polyvagal theory? I do. Okay. <laughs> so you were talking about, um, you were talking about sort of taking down, you're talking about the paired antagonism between sympathetic and, and parasympathetic mm -hmm. and sort of wanting to take people out of sympathetic, but in and into parasympathetic or so mm -hmm. on and so forth. How does that understanding of using neural feedback apply to uh, a frame in a frame based on polyvagal theory where you're wanting to enter ventral ventral the ventral vagal pathway rather than say the sympathetic or the dorsal vagal pathway yeah it's uh polyvagal is one of those things that's a little bit contentious in the lab i come from we're a little more oriented towards uh, brainstem as being a mediator of these things and different orienting responses and the social engagement network and the nerves that run through the neck and how tension actually in the occipital and in the neck and like these early patterns are probably more the mediating factor. Hmm. Uh, and I don't, you know, there, it is contentious, so I don't uh, want to get into it too deeply, but in general, I don't completely adhere to the polyvagal model. Um, so I think that 
what we're doing is we're working on more of the pathways that were laid down early in the psyche that are tied to early orienting responses from the brainstem. And then that early orienting response that if you imagine a baby, you know, the first thing a baby can do is really move its eyes and move its head. So that baby can be drawn towards something it'll look towards, or it will be appalled and there's a tension response and the baby will pull away and retract from that. So depending on how that early little orienting response, which is, you know, different states of arousal, that sets the foundation for now, like the limbic system, which is our emotional response system. And that has a lot to do with the cingulate and how we put our attention on things, how that gets its cues from the brainstem. And then when you're entering into your 20s and the prefrontal cortex starts to myelinate, these lower regions send information up and they are far stronger and more hardwired and uh, will send more signals and even hijack the frontal lobe if they detect threat. And then when the frontal lobe comes in, it starts to like pull down and it wants to have a communication with them. But what I'll see in clients is if they don't have a good relationship with that early orienting response, it led to like this challenge in their sense of self and their emotional regulation when the prefrontal starts to orient, that's when a lot of mental health challenges show up because there's not a relationship. It's like a, uh, a tension. I, I, I can't really flow within myself. And then that seems to be what disrupts our ability to enter into, you know, hyper arousal or hyper arousal or sympathetic or parasympathetic states. Mm. Cool. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> okay. Let's, let's jump back to where we were before I wanted to go on that little tangent there about polyvagal <laughs> theory. Cause I find it very interesting. Um, yeah, and I, and I where it still works. yeah, it's where it's orienting. If it's coming from the vagus nerve or the brainstem, that's contentious. So, um, I asked you earlier about home, uh, neurofeedback tech yeah. and, um, recently, like as we've been gearing up for this interview, you've been like, Ooh, this is something really exciting on the horizon. Um, yeah. and it's not time yet. And then it was just a couple of days ago where you're like, the press release is out, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, and I want, yeah, I want you to talk is- about this because it's curious. It's very curious. Um, yeah. but I know that it sort of starts with a discussion around this group that you're, that you're with this organization called the divergence neurotechnologies. So mm-hmm. before you explain what this big news is, can you give us a sense of, of what this divergence neurotechnologies incorporated is and what your involvement is and what it is that you're hoping to achieve with it. Yeah. And I'll take the narrative approach again, because the narrative approach is actually a a really fun one in this case. Um, So our CEO, Alex Nee, he was working with a group at uh, working with the university of Toronto and the neurology department. And they were developing each, my brain, they were developing EEG headsets Um, around 2018 that we're going to be able to determine and alert individuals with epilepsy Mm. if they were about to have a seizure. So they had designed these portable EEG headsets that would help track, inform, and assess these different epileptic patterns and inform neurologists what was going on with their patients, which would be a huge leap, you know, for individuals with epilepsy. But Basically, funding ran out, FDA approval is challenging to get, and he was on his way to uh, go to China for uh, one of these neurotech conferences, but he was also stopping by Burning Man on the way. So he decided to take the headset with him because he's like, well, why fly here and then fly back to Toronto and then fly to China? And so during that event, he was like, huh, I wonder what kind of recordings I can get while I'm here in the desert. So he took recordings of himself and recordings of some people around him and had some really fun, interesting findings. And somebody had taken a photo of him doing this. And a friend of mine saw it and said, Hey, there's this guy in the desert with EEG headset. Do you know him? And I said, No, but I definitely need to know him. Mm -hmm. So I found him on Facebook and we became instant friends because he lives in Toronto. And I caught him right as this company was starting to fail. And I was just so excited to meet somebody who knew how to build these headsets, who was also so passionate about mental health and had such deep insight into how the brain worked, but also how to create tech. But he'd not heard of neurofeedback. He didn't know much about it. So he was really fascinated about it, but he had to go on to another job. And so he went off 
and we remained friends. But I remember just feeling like, oh, man, like this is the guy who's meant to make these things. And I can't believe that he's going off into the distance because as a clinician, that was the biggest challenge I had where you had said earlier, you know, how often do people need to be having neurofeedback for it to work well? And I framed it as well. It is like going to the gym. So the more frequency, but with days of rest, the better and the quicker the training will be. But it's really cost prohibitive for clients to do that all the time because they're coming in to see me and then we're having to do a therapy appointment. And sometimes if they could have a couple sessions in between before seeing me again, we could actually take it to the next level a little bit sooner or go a little bit deeper. So the pandemic hit and his investors, I guess, came back. They had created this platform and it was just kind of sitting there. And they said, do you think there's anything that we could do for this overwhelming mental health crisis that's approaching given that the pandemic has really like put everyone into isolation and a lot of clinicians can't access their clients anymore? And he said, yep. He's like, I know someone who's got a really good idea and we could move into neurofeedback. So I met the team and they decided, yeah, let's give this a go. And so we just started moving forward with that. And the whole idea was to develop cost effective dry sensor neurofeedback headsets. I've been working with the Neurometation Institute. I see how helpful neurometation is for my clients. And I wanted to just increase access. Uh, we also work with another company called Helium that's been trying to interface VR with mm -hmm. neurofeedback. Mm -hmm. But the challenge is there's no really good headsets out there. So the ones that are out there for the most part struggle with signal to noise ratio processing. And so there's a lot of like dirty signal and we say in the eg world or the neurofeedback world that garbage in garbage out right like i don't want to give you feedback on muscle artifact right. i don't want to train you and a funny thing actually is that people with adhd are sometimes the best at figuring out that if i tense my eyebrows i can make the sound go or <laughs> so you because they're so used to using their bodies to achieve these goals. And so you really have to, you guys are the sneaky ones. We have to really watch <laughs> <laughs> what you're doing to drive the neurofeedback. <laughs> um, yeah, so the company has come together. And on Monday, we finally released uh, the platform and the website. We hope that the headset should be available by spring. They would have been available a little bit sooner. But given COVID, there's been supply chain issues. So. Mm -hmm. We're ready to go. We're just, we've got two headset companies we're working with, one in India called Newfany and one that's out of New York called Neurosity. So, so you're, you're building, you're building effective at home neural feedback headsets, like ones that <laughs> something, something akin to Muse, except that it covers multiple, like covers everywhere you need to go in the brain to get like a, like a full yeah. picture. Yeah. In clinical grade you know, signal quality, signal processing. Um, and the idea is, is that in the end, we're going to be hardware agnostic. We're more of a software company. And that as we progress, we hope that you can attach your Fitbit, you can attach whatever tech you want. We want to give people the ability to kind of start playing with the technology, putting it together, learning how to self-assess, learning how to work with themselves, but also connecting them to one another. So the bigger piece is that it's not about you just sitting there and playing by yourself. It's like, how can you start using this technology to connect to each other? Because mm. I think one of the bigger challenges, and you mentioned it earlier, you know, you're on all these screens doing all these things, but it's kind of just you in this flat screen. But if you were engaging a little bit more, engaging your networks a little bit more, I'd be curious if that would wake your brain up a little bit more because it's more of a dynamic interplay. I'm thinking, I'm thinking again about the book that I, I am only halfway through <laughs> reading that I recommended to yeah. you, Nexus. Um, yeah. right? I'm I think, excited. yeah. Um, I'm also <laughs> thinking too about like, all right. This is uh this is not proprietary. You can you can take this idea and run with it uh, in your company. <laughs> I offer to it freely. Um, which is like the idea of syncing up these headsets through mm. a central hub yeah. that the encouragement is to get to that. I think you said, um, what was the part of the brain that gets activated around shame and then also MDMA? What the was insula. that? The insula. The insula. So yeah. you're, you're trying to encourage 
Like you're trying to encourage that insula activation, but it's directly wired with another person. And so the central hub and the reward is when the two of you are firing the insulas in harmony with each other's brains while looking at each other. That's exactly what the platform already is set up really? to do. Oh, and, that's and this so is cool. what we did. Yeah, so <laughs> that's, that's so cool. novel about this. Yeah. And so this is what we did in the lab. We did co-regulation. So we've already worked this out and this is a lot of fun. You get two people in that deep state, psychedelic state, and you it's called a dual sum squash. So you have to both achieve the state collaboratively to then achieve the reward. And it was the wildest thing because we could let you can feel the other person like kind of coming in or not. Like We're so naturally attuned. I think we've just forgotten how beautifully attuned we are and the capacity that humans have for limbic resonance. And, you know, part of the name divergence is because I love neurodiversity and I like concepts of neurodiversity and this idea that a divergence isn't a disorder. Mm. And some of the divergence are like high sensory processing, highly sensitive people, ADHD and autism as some of the divergence that in, you know, the world before uh, our modern age, those individuals were more like canaries in the coal mine, right? Their sensitivities helped the groups. We know highly sensitive individuals make up about 20% of both the animal and the human population, and they tend to have more fine-tuned feelings, so like the empaths, those that feel, and they'll sometimes feel a little bit isolated and feared, but they were the ones in the herd that would, you know, find a new path or notice the tiger approaching the group, and we don't want everybody in the herd to be more on that neurotic kind of high sensitivity end, but having a percentage is helpful, and so understanding how these divergencies and then like connecting with people with divergencies and connecting with all of our unique natural, you know, fragrances from the flowers actually brings about harmony when people are more self attuned and we can connect from that place. So there's actually um, some people I'm speaking to right now and I stumbled into them in the alt space world because I've recently discovered VR, which has been like my extroverts best <laughs> pandemic kind of outlet lately um there's a bunch of vr content creators and they're looking at something called the connected experience and they had created at burning man some like neuro interface uh art pieces and so we're yeah we're in discussions of like how can we bring even these headsets into the virtual world and collaborate on like virtual environments changing and i've had ideas of imagine that kids you could create worlds where, you know, their attention is so scattered or just so fixated. They're on flat screens playing video games a lot. You know, my son, all of his connections right now are online. And I'm like, where is he getting that empathy and that felt sense or even learning how to like sit in silence once in a while outside of me encouraging him to do it, <laughs> but like making gamifying it a little bit. So you could have like a video game where, it starts out kind of chaotic and they learn a meditative task. And as they learn the meditative task, things start to settle down, but you can't unlock the next dimension until you've unlocked that cognitive state or that attentional state. Mm. And then once you have it, you go to the next dimension and it's like all like playing video games through states. That's crazy. It's like, uh, it, it, it's like taking, taking video games instead of having a handset, you have a headset. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Exactly. Um, yeah play like facebook games you know a little batting around hamburgers and stuff using our attention um i i i want to ask you about this 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 new collaboration divergence mm -hmm. um is having but first i what you're talking there about with the highly sensitive people um being canaries in the coal mine i kind of feel like i am a highly sensitive person um and there have been relationships in my life where I have been gaslit for pointing at things that I knew to be a problem, even though that person was like, I don't see a problem. So there's no problem, but it turns out in the long run, it was actually a significant contributor to dysfunctional mm. relational patterns that ultimately damage the relationship over the long haul. Mm. Um, and it's nice to sort of feel like, okay, actually, yeah, I'm not just a broken pathological human being. No. Um, but uh, I mean, everyone can manage that in an effective, healthy yeah. or not so healthy way. And part of growing up is learning how to do that. But it yeah. makes me think of a comment you had said in another podcast that I, I wrote down here because I just thought it was such a beautiful 
a beautiful quote, which is, maybe we've been hypnotized into thinking, oh, maybe we've been hypnotized into pathologizing healthy responses to an unhealthy system. Yeah, and that comes from uh, being introduced to Dr. Yellowbird's work on neurodecolonization and noticing how similar his work using mindful states to decolonize the mind actually involves targeting the insula and our felt sense so that we can connect more and how our modern world is actually such a disconnected world. We spend so little time with nature. We spend so little time one-on-one. We're we're not in collective environments anymore. And this has been really hard on people. And then we have a diagnostic system (laughs) that says, well, you're, you got a pathology and you got a brain disorder. And, there's a spectrum, you know, there are people who are born that need to be in a wheelchair, their bodies are not formed like the average person. That's not, you know, and we find ways of supporting that. And I I think mental health should be looked at the same, like there's divergencies, there's a spectrum, can we have a better understanding of like, how much of that was habituated and how much of it is actually something that just needs a support. But do we really need to pathologize people for that? I don't think so. Like, Some individuals are tall and some individuals are short. The tall people need to learn how to duck and the short people need a ladder once in a while. But if the short person just is like, oh, I have a disorder because I can't be tall, like that's not really Mm -hmm. supportive. And I I think almost the way we've had a lot of racial trauma do it, like the way we look differently, there's still a lot of like trauma around these natural innate divergent traits that people have and trying to get everyone to some strange average. Mm. A, a strange i mean from the racial standpoint of a strange a strange average um yeah. that historically has been more or less white person yeah and we have the, a whole blah, model blah, blah, blah. yeah based out of colonial beliefs and systems and i i think there's a lot of room for growth and going a little bit deeper with that mm-hmm. definitely <laughs> i mean that's that's clear uh the last mm-hmm. <laughs> the the i mean public discourse on on the obvious issues of racism are is making evident how much room for growth we have as a society and as individuals that make up that society. Yeah. And mental health has mostly been studied on, you know, white men. mm -hmm. Like even there's a really wonderful book called Divergent Mind. And it's all about, you know, divergent women and health, their mental health and how little research has been done on them and how ADHD women are a little bit different sometimes than ADHD men. And yet there's a spectrum, right? Like Mm -hmm. we'll cross over, but there are still some differences that we need to consider. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, So Divergence Divergence Neurotechnology Incorporated has recently announced a partnership with the um, Entheon Biomedical Partners for predictive biomarker platform development. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What are you doing? Uh, It means that we are developing an EEG platform that will help determine somebody's like depth of experience during we're focusing first on DMT. And we're also looking at so not just the depth, uh, having an assessment tool that helps us understand depth based on biomarker, but also predictions based on these EEG phenotypes that were proposed by Jay Gunkelman. And these phenotypes are basically semi stable states that are kind of the bridge between the genetic makeup and somebody's actual like who they are. So it's it's kind of like a temperament in some ways, but we have found that these phenotypes actually can change the way you respond to different medications. And so by being able to identify and classify where somebody falls on that spectrum, we're hoping to better assess which psychedelic, pharmaceutical therapy, entheogen would meet somebody where they are Mm. as they are in that moment and not take them on some wild ride so this already has been applied a lot with pharmaceuticals and it has been quite successful just like they're starting to align pharmaceuticals with genetics right so we're hoping to add to that yeah yeah, through you know typical testing and biomarker testing Mm. cool very cool Mm -hmm. um well let's 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 turn let's turn the corner home here um, I feel very excited about about all of this, um, and maybe we'll we'll just we'll turn the corner home and end with, uh, you know what? Actually, I was gonna say, you know, 
where can people follow what you do and so on and so forth um where can they get involved with coming to see you at your clinic if if mm -hmm. i mean nothing's really open i think presently in ontario yeah. but um uh, distance type stuff but mm -hmm. i think maybe i kind of want to ask you this open-end question mm -hmm. um because i don't know and the i don't know is something like is there anything based on the conversation we've had here today that you feel like you would make sure is heard as a part of this conversation before before it's done? I think the biggest piece is exactly kind of what you said when I brought up that piece about, you know, we've been hypnotized into believing that there's pathologies when really it's a response to the environment we're living in. So if you don't feel like you're getting answers, and there's something in you that's saying, you know, I feel like there's more, or I feel like there, I'm being put in a box that I don't quite understand. Keep looking for therapies and keep looking to different individuals to see if you can find someone that aligns, because there are more and more clinicians that are coming forward who are stepping into these understandings that this is more about adaptation than it is about pathology. So a lot of somatic therapists looking into neurofeedback therapists. Um, they can look into the Neuro Meditation Institute. We've got like even a free course online right now, or they can look into our website at divergenceneuro.com and sign up for the beta testing. We're hoping that that's going to be out in April and just follow what we're doing because the goal is this is supposed to be a collaborative project. Like I want to create technology that works like mycelium. And so we want to create a platform that allows people to put apps and put technologies and put those different things on it so that we can all start collaborating and playing together. We want people to like own their data, have access to their own data. We don't want to just collect it and make it another Facebook where we mine it and then try to control you. I want technology that's reflective and gives people their attention back to them. So you could have a headset on and the headset could be saying, it's like a Fitbit for your brain in some ways where it's like, hey, you know, that hour you've spent scrolling has actually increased your heart rate and lowered your SpO2 and you're going into a stress response and like wake you up to your innate relationship with your nervous system. And so we start trusting in the wisdom of our bodies a little bit more and the wisdom of connecting to one another, and the wisdom of nature when we connect with it and trying to seek more connection and less uh, distancing, even in the time of the pandemic. I think there are ways of doing this if we take the time to think about it and reach out to others to connect. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, where can people find out more about your work or get in contact with you? Uh, DivergenceNeuro.com is a really great way to find me through there or heather at divergenceneuro.com. Great. Thank you very much, Heather Hargraves, for being on the show today. I really appreciate your time. And I feel super excited about uh, what you're bringing into the world. Thank you for having me. It's great. And cut. Okay, that's it for this episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Thank you so much for tuning in. Thank you for following up with Heather's work if you uh, felt inspired by the content of the show. Um, she's great, her stuff is fantastic, and uh, I'm looking forward to once COVID pandemic restrictions are lifted and it makes sense for everyone involved, try a little bit of psilocybin and uh, inform neurofeedback for myself. Um, but there's an important point I wanna make here at the end. And it is a conflict of interest um, point. After my interview with Heather, I did some research into her company, Neurodivergence, uh, Divergent Neuro, and their parent company or their partner company, Entheon Biomedical something or other. And I decided to invest some money in that company. I'm not invested in very many companies. I try to invest only in companies that I believe are doing work ethically in psychedelic culture, but I am invested in that particular company. I don't think necessarily you should invest in them, nor am I encouraging you to. I encourage you to make whatever choices you think are smart and reasonable for you. But I also want you to know that I'm invested in that company and that I was invested in it after I produced this episode. And nothing about what you heard there was meant to encourage you to invest in them. That's your choice. My choice is not your choice. And I'm not encouraging you to do it or not do it. Okay. So I think the type of integrity of that, of you know, I think there's a type of integrity in providing you that conflict of interest, which 
I want to do. I think it's also legally, I'm legally obliged. I don't know if that's true, but I think from an integrity standpoint, I am obliged. So that is, that's what that is. Um, wow, so many issues with the industrializing of psychedelics right now that, I mean, if you haven't checked out the rise of psychedelic capitalism or, or, or sense making psychedelic capitalism episode I did with, um, Alexander Biner from Rebel Wisdom a few episodes back, check that out. Um, or the, um, the psychedelic cafe about, about corporate influence. It's a messy and complex situation. And, uh, as much as I'm kind of bored talking about it in all honesty, there will be some more episodes about it in the future, but I'm trying to avoid having too much politics because I mean, honestly, it just gets a bit boring and, um, politics are not the only things that exist in life, even if politics are obviously very important anyways. So I'm on my Dr. Bronner's soapbox right now. Sorry about that. Um, and <laughs> not sponsored by Dr. Bronner's just forget. I even mentioned them. It was just a reference to where that uh, saying came from apparently. Um, but that's all. Thank you for tuning into the podcast. Thank you for liking, subscribing, sharing this show, signing up for the newsletter and becoming a patron on Patreon. Um, those Patreon pledges mean a lot. So thank you very much. And, uh, yeah, that's all. I will see you on the next episode of Adventures Through the Mind. Take care.